crossroads in Crossroads Family and Friends. I'm so very happy that you're here with me today. This is the beautiful Sunday before Thanksgiving 2020. And this is Pastor Bob Barker with this week's installment of Crossroads Today, the weekly message portion of our regular Sunday morning worship service from Crossroads Community Church right here in Uptown Dallas. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. You know, it's been almost 400 years since the very first Thanksgiving in November of 1621. I'm sure you all know that. So it's almost been 400 years. Uh, then later on, the Continental Congress would go on to declare the first national Thanksgiving on December 18th, 1777. Then again, in 1789, George Washington declared the last Thursday in November a national Thanksgiving as well. Yeah, a little bit of trivia here this morning. And all of these were just declarations, though. They weren't official holidays. But it was when Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a president in 1939, made the fourth Thursday of November a national holiday of celebration, which we now call Thanksgiving. It was later on approved by Congress in 1941. So even then, it took Congress a couple of years to just decide if they were going to make that a national holiday or if it was just going to roll around every once in a while. So. Today, we have the national holiday of Thanksgiving, where all Americans should be coming together, taking a few moments out of our busy lives and stop to remember just what we're supposed to be thankful for. And I say supposed to be because not everyone, not every American realizes just how thankful they really should be. Today, this is a very day that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Thanksgiving Day this year and what it's about and what it means to me and, and our country. And we've been through a lot this last year of 2020. I know, I know you know we have. I think about all the problems we've had this year and they've been many, haven't they? Issues like racial inequality, police and law enforcement issues that we've had, social injustice, uh, demonstrations with all the riots and destruction and looting. And the terrible thing about all that, that was before the pandemic really hit. So here we are nine months after the initial uh, severe outbreak of the COVID-19 and almost a quarter of a million people, almost a quarter of a million, 250,000 Americans are dead as a result of the virus and millions are in our hospitals and CEUs, are, and the, the patient load is just is unbelievable, un, incomprehensible. We've had a contentious and serious political environment this last you know, several months with the impeached president who doesn't want to concede a proper and valid election, ending with the same results of victory that he had from his election in 2016. I mean, what is our world coming to? But even with all of that, when I think about Thanksgiving, I think about all the things that our country has gone through to provide us with the liberties and the freedoms that we have today, which are many, many. And I think about all the challenges and the troubles that we've had, but I am still thankful because I've been fortunate to have been able to travel a lot internationally. And I've seen many other countries and civilizations and how they work. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. Even at our worst, even at our worst, America is still the finest country in the world. I think about my health, my family, and my soon-to-be spouse, Jeff, and I are getting married. You, know, you already know that. And how grateful I am to serve God who carries me with my life and all the other things that I consider so important. He carries them right on through in the palm of his hand because he cares for me and he cares for you. He's concerned about us. When you think about what God has done for you, what do you think about? In this Thanksgiving time, when you think about what God has done for you, what has he done for you? What is one thing that God has done for you this year? Did he save you from an accident? Has he healed you this year? I know he's taken care of me financially throughout the year, and it was a year that I didn't know how things were going to turn out, but they've all, you know, God's done okay. And he started thinking about this year for me financially a couple of years ago. Now, some of you may remember that I was able to sell some oil and mineral rights on some family-owned property that had been in my, my grandmother bought it. 
God started that process of taking care of me a couple of years ago because he knew what this year was going to be like even before I did. He knew that there would be no travel, no public seminars for me to speak at. He knew all of that, and he took care of me starting way back in 2018. So I'm thankful that he loves me enough to provide for my needs even before I knew I would have them. That's why one of his names is Jehovah Jireh. He sees the need ahead of time and takes care of it. We serve a mighty God, folks. So let me ask you a question. What has God done for you this year that you're thankful for? What has God done for you this year? Would you do me a favor? Would you go over there in the comments section of Facebook? And would you, would you type just one or two words in there? God healed me. God saved me took me through financial issues, whatever it is, just type in that comment section right now because I'm going to read those as we go through. You know, uh, and if you're watching later on YouTube, just put it in the comment section. I'll get it later. Sometimes we have battles in our lives and some of those battles are due, unfortunately, to our own inner turmoil in ourselves. We're trying to decide to do it in our way. How, how am I going to take care of this need? You know what's isn't always God's way. Isn't always God's way. And as a parent, I look at my girls and I see how smart they are, how they've really done, each and every one of them have great, have done great with their, in their own lives, with their own skills. And over the years, I've seen some of their personal decisions cost them a lot of heartache and pain. And uh, I pray that those bad decisions will turn out for more success than defeat. And in most of the cases, that's the way it's turned out. There have been many times when I, as a parent, would have liked to have stepped in right at the middle of their decision-making process and stopped them from making the decision that I knew would end with a mistake because I could see the potential pain that would come from these decisions. And mostly, because of my age and a different parental perspective, I would be able to see that when they couldn't see that. And if I feel that way, if I want to step in and help my kids when they're making a bad mistake. Don't you think God does that same thing? If I feel that way, don't you know our Heavenly Father also feels that way? That there are times when He would like to step in and to keep us from making certain decisions that He knows are not going to be in our best interest. One of my all-time favorite Bible stories kind of goes along this way. God wanted Jonah to minister to the city of Nineveh. God wanted him to go and to preach so that he would spare their lives. He wanted Nineveh to turn around and repent. But see, Jonah didn't want that. Jonah didn't want to see him spared because he wanted them to pay for killing his relatives during an invasion of his own homeland. So his thoughts were, you know, if I don't preach to these people, God's not going to turn around and he's going to kill all of these people that killed all of my family and my friends. So that sounds like a little twisted, like right out of a, you know, a hit modern TV uh, series, you know, here in the 21st century. But I'll tell you something, Jonah should have done what God wanted him to do. He should have made the right decision. But you know what? Sometimes, like us, we don't make the right decisions. Jonah didn't either. Instead of going to Nineveh, he went down to the water, got on a boat. We know the story. The boat had a lot of, a lot of storms just as soon as they got out of the way, and they, they cast lots, and they threw Jonah overboard. Yeah. So most of us know that story. It's found over here in Jonah chapter 1. We're going to start reading verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. That's a long time to be in a belly of a big fish. Can you imagine? It's been eating. It's been feasting, and you're part of that, you know? But let's start reading here in Jonah chapter 2. So starting with verse 1, we're going to read 10 verses, so watch on the screen. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, 
In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep within the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayers rose to you and your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols... Turn away from God's love from them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon dry ground, dry land. Tremendous story. We've heard that story since we were little kids in, in vacation Bible school and in Sunday school. God caused a big fish to catch him, to keep him safe, till he learned what was really going on. Jonah was in the belly of the fish, get this, three days and three nights. Then he prayed. Why do you think people take so long? Why does it take so long for people to get out of their own personal misery and to ask God to help them? When in reality, God is waiting right there to help us. God was there all the time. It took Jonah three days and three nights to come to his own senses to realize he needed to call out on God. He was working it out on his own. It wasn't working. <laughs> it wasn't working. The reason? Let me ask you. Is it pride that we don't want to go to God that we think that we can do ourselves? When pride goes before a fall, shouldn't we expect it to happen? I think so. I love what David says here in Psalms. Look over here in Psalm chapter 100. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Through all generations. All the way till now. From the time Jonah was swallowed in the well, all that time, his love for us has never left still continues. He says to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Why? Because of his faithfulness. It continues through all generations. Thanksgiving is learning to give God the thanks for what he's doing in your life and for who he is to you as a believer. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. Paul knew what life was like when things were easy, but he also know, knew what God was like when it was really hard. Writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Yep, he did. But most of those times that he was writing were really difficult circumstances. He was shipwrecked, left for dead, beaten, jailed in the deepest part of the jails just so he couldn't tell anyone about how great God really was. And when Paul spoke to the church at Corinth, trying to give them some direction, he was always reminding them that no matter what, God was going to see them through. And he knew from his own personal experiences that God was going to get them through, no matter what it was. You know, maybe your life isn't going to go down to the deepest part of the jail or be swallowed by a well. But you know what? Sometimes our lives can be pretty pathetic, can't they? And that's the moment, the moment that it gets on the brink of that pathetic state. We need to remember to run to God and to praise him and to thank him for what he's done. That's what, that's what Jonah did. Paul goes on, though, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look over here in verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. And over here, look over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. To spread the aroma, the aroma. I love the aroma of him. I love the aroma of God. You can smell him. It's like driving through Florida. You can open the windows and you can smell the blossoms, the citrus blossoms. It's the aroma of what's going on. You can smell the very presence of God. You know what? Many of you are getting ready. You know what Thursday is? Turkey Day. Uh, your Thanksgiving dinners, I know. And if I were to come to your home, I would walk in and I could smell the aroma of good things cooking. Certainly. That would be a part of my senses. I would recognize it. There would be those wonderful smells of the turkey cooking in the oven, those fresh yeast rolls browning, maybe the smell of a pecan or a pumpkin pie wafting throughout the house. You're remembering those smells right now and you haven't even started cooking and your mouth is probably watering because all of that goodness, you remember what it like is to taste of the Lord, taste of good food. That's what Paul is talking about here. Even in the most difficult of times, we should be thankful that all the people around us can perceive that wonderful goodness, the aroma of Jesus Christ in our life. We should be able to remember all of his goodness and his kindnesses throughout the year, but especially at this time of Thanksgiving. And our praise and our thanksgiving should be able to be perceived by all those around us because they can sense that aroma of his goodness on us as well. They can, if we've got things to be thankful for, and every one of us do. Now, I know some of you have endured some really pretty hard times this year. You know, we've had some prayer times, haven't we? And I'm going to encourage you to still give glory to God, not for those difficult times, but because Jesus saw you through those difficult times. Just like our country has had to endure difficult times in the past and still does, we're going to stop on Thursday and we will give God glory for all that he's done for us and has seen us through and provided for us this year, just like every other year. Some of you are still in the middle of some of those difficult times. And I'm going to tell you right now that God is going to see you through as well. Look over here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He says, give, er give thanks in everything. It doesn't say give thanks for everything. God doesn't do things bad. That's the devil's job. Look over in John 1.1. 1, 1. We know that. But when things bad happen, we still give him praise because it could have been a whole lot worse. But he is going to see us through. So let me ask you to think just for a moment. What are you thankful for? I'd like to think about it just for a moment. What are you thankful for? Very truly thankful for. Have you thought of something? Then what I'd like you to do, whatever you're thankful for, I want you to go over there to the comments section of Facebook right now to the screen, and I want you to type in what you're thankful for. If you're watching later, you can do it underneath in the comments section of, of YouTube. I just want you to know what you're thankful for this year. You see, God has been faithful to each one of us in so many ways. So, so many ways. I know I'm thankful for you. Even though I don't get to see you like I really want, I still know that God is watching over you because I pray that he's going to. So I'm thankful that you're faithful. You are. Our church is probably the most faithful church I, I, I know anywhere because we're faithful. We're spiritual. And we understand that if we give, God will honor that giving and reward us financially. And I want to thank you for watching over your church this year. I'm thankful for that. We've only had probably outside, get past March, we only had those four services in June. And here we are at the, almost the end of, end of um, November. Our church still exists when many churches have already fallen or will fail before the end of the year because their people have just left and they're just not coming back. I'm thankful 
that God has called you to this church. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you are faithful in your giving. Not to this church, but you're faithful to God. And because of that, the church still is here. We've met every bill, every need that we've had this year. Every single one. Not been laid on anything. Now, I can't say that I wasn't stretched a couple of times because I was, but I know that God took care of us. God took care of us. So each week, if it weren't for you and your faithfulness, we might not be able to carry on the ministry of the church. As I said before, the Pew Institute did a study this year already that said that about 20% of the churches that aren't having in-service meetings, about 20% of them will not make it to reopen after we get the vaccine this next year. So I'm thankful that we will not be one of those. But I will tell you, it's because you are faithful, not only to Jesus, but to your home church as well. I love that about you. We need to remind ourselves that when difficult times come, and they will, Paul said, things will happen. We praise God anyway. We praise God anyway. So let me challenge you between now and the end of this week, before Thursday, be mindful of what God has done for you. Be thankful as I am thankful for you. Now, here's the thing. If you want to worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings today, you can by simply going to the Facebook homepage of Crossroads Community Church. And there on the right side of the page, you'll see the little sign up icon. Click on it and it'll take you right to the Giveify app where you can give any amount you'd like to give. And if you're on a mobile device like your phone or a tablet, you can do the same thing. Just navigate to the Facebook homepage for Crossroads and there you'll see the, the little sign up icon. Click on it and it'll take you to the Giveify app where you can give any amount you'd like to give. You know, this Thursday is Thanksgiving. So when you're around the table or Zooming with your family and friends like Dr. Fauci is going to be doing with his family this, this Thursday, take a moment and thank God for Crossroads. Thank God that Crossroads has allowed us to continue to minister here at his pleasure. And let's not take that for granted, okay? I'm so thankful for you today. I'm thankful that God has allowed me to get to know each and every one of you as your pastor. Some of you for many years, some of you just for a few. But it's been my pleasure to be your pastor, and I love each and every one of you. So know that you're in my thoughts and you're in my prayers today. And thank you for being here with me today. This has been your pastor, Bob Barker, with Crossroads Today, reminding you that God's miracles are yours today, and I'll see you here next Sunday. Bye-bye. Thank you.